Just days after Square Enix's president stated that Japanese companies shouldn't be making Western games, the publisher sold all its Western development studios. Good morning, good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for May 3rd, 2022. If you'd prefer to consume the show the way it's intended, in a podcast feed, so you can listen on your phone as you get ready for work, or drive on your way to work, Head to patreon.com slash sifted and pledge at $4 or more per month. It's free on our YouTube channel for everyone else, but people, you're going to have to watch some ads. You can find the four days delayed feed of our flagship show Game Face by searching your favorite podcast service. Please give the show a review if you can. So Square Enix has sold most of its Western studios and IP to Embracer Group. Now, I don't want to discuss this too much here on Good Morning Gaming because... We'll be addressing it on Game Face later today. By the way, see you on the stream at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash games. But I can touch on the story at least a little bit. Embracer is an upstart publisher that has been buying studios and assets like candy for the last couple years. It has now acquired Crystal Dynamics, Eidos Montreal, and Square Enix Montreal, which is basically a mobile developer. Included in the deal is a catalog of IP including Tomb Raider, Deus Ex, Thief, Legacy of Kane, and more than 50 back catalog titles which have yet to be revealed. The purchase price is reportedly $300 million. At first, it seems like a big discount and a great deal for Embracer. Two AAA studios, a mobile developer, and some really popular IP for just $300 million. For reference, Sony just paid $3.6 billion for Bungie alone. But when you really start digging into it, the price does start to make a little more sense. It was revealed through the course of the sale that Deus Ex has sold just 12 million units between its last two releases, and they have been on sale for a long time, meaning that they've been deep discounted, and still after all of that, the two games only made it to 12 million sold total. Square Enix itself decided against making more, so that probably tells you as much as you need to know. Tomb Raider has been far more successful and is easily the crown jewel of the sale. There's no doubt about it. It sells anywhere from 10 to 12-ish million units per entry, depending on reviews. But Square Enix was even unhappy with that. Both Legacy of Cain and Thief are old, tired IP that haven't really been relevant in quite a while, and it's hard to imagine, well, actually with Embracer, I could see Embracer reviving those franchises, because Embracer so far has kind of been known as a double-A developer, taking the IP that it buys and reviving it, but not putting a ton of money towards the development of those games. So while I could see... Embracer doing something with Legacy of Cain and Thief, most publishers, I think, would probably just let that sleeping dog lie. The big pieces in this deal are the two AAA studios and Tomb Raider. Now, both studios have struggled to be profitable, and the latest figures that I saw was their profit margins. One of them was like 3%, and the other was like 1.2% profit margin. That's not good at all. And both studios have struggled. Not just to be profitable, but to make games that people want to play. They were handed the Marvel license and essentially failed with Avengers. That was an all-hands-on-deck type game where they were getting support from other studios other than the main studio that was developing the game. And you guys by now have all played Avengers or decided you do not want to play Avengers. And that was a huge, huge product. That IP cost a lot of money. And that's where I'm guessing that low profit margin is coming from. I'm assuming Square Enix is charging these studios with the cost of the IP. So on deeper inspection, the price for this sale is about right, provided these studios can tighten the ship and finish games more quickly in the future. Because that's where the value of this deal is. In Tomb Raider and in the two studios that you assume can keep producing triple-A quality games into the foreseeable future. And when you go to buy a company, typically what you do is you pay seven times revenue. So you figure out 
you know, what's the average revenue that a company generates in a year, and you pay them for seven years of that. And considering a lot of development studios may get two games out in those seven years, then it may be a slight overpay, but provided these studios don't completely bleed all the talent through the sale, conceivably there's going to be five, six, seven Tomb Raider games. Eventually you're going to make your money back, even if you do nothing with the rest of the IP, which, as I said, is likely to not happen because Embracer has been reviving a lot of old IP. So Tomb Raider is always going to do well, and that is really the crux of this deal. Is Tomb Raider worth $300 million all on its own? No, probably not. In the long run, you probably get your money back on Tomb Raider alone. But really, the value from this deal comes from the studios. And as we've said many times on Game Face and Good Morning Gaming, spending money on talent is tough unless you are going to provide incentives to keep that talent, like PlayStation did when it bought Bungie. It dedicated $1.3 billion of that $3.6 billion towards keeping Bungie's employees with bonuses and things like that. And that is something that Embracer is going to have to consider because otherwise you just paid $300 million for the Tomb Raider IP. So it'll be interesting to see how this all shakes out. And we'll really dig into Square Enix's motivation to sell these assets on Game Face later today. But its president recently said that Japanese studios shouldn't develop Western-styled games, and he definitely put his wallet where his mouth was, and Embracer filled it up with money. And now for a couple more stories from the top of your sifts. We call out the industry when it does bad stuff on Good Morning Gaming, so it's only right that we mention when it does something good. Activision announced today that the Call of Duty endowment has now placed 100,000 veterans into jobs. If you've ever spent much time around the development teams that create Call of Duty, you quickly realize that its endowment is very important to them. They work hand-in-hand -hand with veterans to help make the game authentic, and this charity is yet another way for them to give back. The endowment says it has hit an estimated $5.6 billion in economic value for U.S. and United Kingdom veterans and hit its goals two years ahead of schedule after its 12th year of existence. Less than a tenth of 1% of the U.S. government's roughly $300 billion veteran spend is focused on unemployment and the endowment has placed veterans in sustainable jobs at a tenth of the cost of similar efforts by the U.S. Department of Labor. Kudos to Activision and the Call of Duty teams. If you've missed the time travel element of The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, we possibly have good news for you. The Italian voice actor who plays Daruk is returning for the sequel to Breath of the Wild, and he recently stated that he's recorded lines for both Daruk and Daruk's ancestor. So maybe there's no time travel, but at the very least, the game could include time jumps or flashbacks. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wait a while to find out. In other Nintendo news, the outdated chips and other components inside the Switch have been a godsend for the platform holder through the pandemic. With no competition for its components, Nintendo has basically been untouched by the supply chain issues and component shortages plaguing production of most items over the last two years. Well, it appears that even Nintendo's luck has finally run out. It's taken a while, but Japanese publication Nikkei is reporting Nintendo will sell 10% less consoles in the current fiscal year due to China's zero-COVID lockdown. Nikkei also reports that the company is looking to offset the lost revenue with an increase in software releases, which could explain why the launch of Xenoblade Chronicles 3 was mysteriously pushed up to July 29th. Arcade 1UP fully unveiled the NBA Jam Shack Edition arcade cabinet today. The cabinet is 66 inches high, which is 8 inches higher than the company's existing NBA Jam machine, with a 19-inch screen, Wi-Fi, and three playable games, NBA Jam, NBA Jam Tournament Edition, and NBA Hangtime. No word on the exact year for the rosters in any of the three. It's available to pre-order now for just $700. That's a lot. With order shipping out this August. At this point, most people know Oculus for the Wireless Quest or Quest 2 VR HMD. While they provide a lot more freedom for play, they're decidedly weaker than wired headsets that Oculus built its name on. But don't think the success of Quest 2 is going to make Oculus forget its roots. Its next high-end HMD is codenamed Project Cambria. Initial rumor suggested it would cost around 800 bucks, which is a tough ask when Quest 2 sells for just 300 
Now Upload VR is reporting that the cost will likely be significantly higher. The publication claims that this information was sent directly from Meta, aka Facebook, so straight from the horse's mouth. To be fair, Meta is trying to position the headset as a work-related piece of hardware and promises several more headsets before the end of 2024, which would be more consumer-based. But Cambria will also play games. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's Boss Fight, where I discuss topics that may or may not be related to video games. Yesterday I caught a glimpse at the bottom of my white PlayStation 5 DualSense controller, and it was absolutely disgusting. <laughs> I'm not sure why Sony went with white by default, but it's a magnet for hand sweat and other gunk. As I cleaned it off, I started thinking about other controllers, and soon my mind wandered to the best controllers of all time. But what makes the best controller of all time? Surely, for someone who's disabled, Xbox's accessibility controller is the best ever. Fair enough. But for most of us, it's likely a combination of ergonomics, button and stick placement, how responsive it is, things like that. For starters, the most ergonomic controller I've ever used, meaning the one that felt best just sitting in my hands, is the GameCube controller. Now, the lack of a second stick in favor of the weird, nubby, yellow C-stick was a huge mistake, and the button placement and sizing is all messed up, but that controller feels like butter in your hands. I also like the triggers that slide in and click as it reaches its max squeeze. I also think the stick placement is totally dependent on the player. Some like the two sticks together, like the PlayStation controller, or offset, like the Xbox and Switch controllers. Personally, I prefer the sticks offset, so just keep that in mind. So with these parameters in mind, here are my top five console controllers of all time. Not up for debate. <laughs> Number five, the Switch Pro Controller. Now, when people think of Switch, they immediately think of the Joy-Con, and I totally get that, because they're the motion controllers, they're the first controllers that were shown, and there are these crazy demos that showed off all this crazy functionality. Actually, now that I'm talking about it, maybe it should be the Joy-Con number five. <laughs> but no, I'm kidding. The Joy-Con are polarizing for some people because people don't necessarily like motion controls. And I think because of that, some people harbor grievances against the Joy-Con. And it's hard to argue against the fact that they're not very ergonomic. So honestly, I spend way more time playing Nintendo Switch with the Switch Pro Controller and really... For all intents and purposes, it's kind of an older Xbox controller, like the original Xbox controller S, the one that came after the Duke. That's what it reminds me of, although it's a little bit more ergonomic. One thing that does set the Switch Pro Controller apart is its rumble. Now, I think it's supposed to have like 3D rumble or something like that, but it's just, it's different. It's like, it's more subtle, but also more abrupt, if that makes sense. Like if I close my eyes, and you put controllers in my hand, and you're like, okay, what's this controller? And you let it rumble, I would know immediately that it was the Switch Pro Controller. There's just something about the way the force feedback works that it's unique and different. And it does have offset sticks, which I appreciate. It also has all the requisite buttons that you could ever need. The only other argument I would have is that maybe the home button could have a little bit of a better placement so I didn't hit it on accident as much as I do. I'm wondering if a lot of you guys have that problem too. I hit the home button a lot on accident on that controller. But otherwise, it feels good, it plays well, and to me, for most games, it's an upgrade over playing with the Joy-Con, at least for games that do not require some form of motion control. Number four, the perfect number for this entry, the DualShock 4. The DualShock 4, to me, was PlayStation's first excellent controller. It always felt like PlayStation controllers before the DualShock 4 were imitating something else. Now, one thing I would say, all PlayStation controllers do not have offset sticks. The sticks are basically symmetrical on the controller. 
And some people like that, and I get that. I'm not a huge fan of that because I kind of learned how to use dual sticks as the sticks offset. But the rest of the controller is just sublime. Everything about it. The ergonomics, the way the triggers feel. Triggers are great for driving games. The buttons on the face feel great. They never wore out. Now, one thing I will say is that my first DualShock 4 did very quickly suffer from analog stick drift. In fact, I discovered analog stick drift on the DualShock 4 before I ever discovered it on the Switch Joy-Con. I remember I sat my controller down and walked away, and when I came back, my character was walking across the screen. I believe that was for Uncharted 4, if I remember correctly. And I was like, oh my gosh! <laughs> the character's moving and I'm not doing anything. So I did have to replace the DualShock 4 pretty quickly, and so his durability is a little bit suspect for me, but as far as an all-purpose controller that worked with pretty much any genre and just felt like it just worked the way it was supposed to, DualShock 4, great choice. Number three, and this might be a little controversial, and I have a feeling some people are going to argue that I'm insane for placing this in the third slot, but please hear me out. Number three for me, the Xbox Elite Series 2 controller. Now, before you start freaking out, I know this may be number one on some of your lists. If some of you guys are Xbox players and you've been using either the Elite Series 1 or the Elite Series 2, this may be your favorite controller, maybe of all time. And I understand that. And it does have features that are amazing. I like how you can adjust the tension on the analog sticks. I like how you can plug it in. And there's a whole app you can go and you can adjust all these different things in it that you can't adjust in other controllers. I like that there's different analog stick heights that you can choose depending on how you like to play. But to me, this controller has a huge fundamental problem. And that is that the paddles on the back, if you don't want to use them, the controller becomes uncomfortable. And I am one of those people. Now, if you're an esports pro or whatever, I'm sure you love those paddles on the back of this thing. I'm sure they do some kind of crazy thing for you that gives you an edge. I am not that guy. I, I'm not an esports guy. I do care about playing competitively, which is honestly why this controller is not number one for me, because it hurts my hands. So for me, I don't use the paddles. So I removed the paddles, put them back in the little case that they gave me. But now there are these really hard and awkward plastic nubs on the back of the controller. And at first, when I took the paddles out, I was like, hmm... I don't know which is worse, the paddles or this. I put the paddles back in, they became more distracting to me, I took them out, and now I just deal with this awkward surface on the back of the controller. And that's a big deal. <laughs> I'm also not really a fan of the force feedback in the controller. I also don't think the triggers have enough travel in them. But otherwise, it is a sublime controller, and I wouldn't begrudge anyone for spending the money and picking it up. And the craftsmanship of the controller is worth the money that they're asking for it. It's just for my specific purposes, it is not ideal. Number two, and this also might be controversial, but to me, the number two controller of all time is the PlayStation 5 DualSense controller. It is awesome. <laughs> it really is. I couldn't put the Nintendo 64 controller on here because it's just, <laughs> it was built for very specific things and it wasn't versatile enough, but you know, it had rumble in it. It was like the first controller that had feedback. The DualSense controller gives me that same vibe because it has done something so drastic with the force feedback, the haptic feedback, and the, the fact that the triggers will provide resistance against what you're doing. If you do not have a PS5 and you have never used a DualSense controller, it's hard to explain. And I'm sure if you've never used it, you're sitting there saying, Shane, you're full of it. That sounds like a gimmick. It's not a gimmick. Now, I will admit, I turn this stuff off when I'm playing competitively. So when I play Call of Duty or a shooter and I just want to play well, I do turn it off because it will keep you from being able to squeeze the trigger as quickly as you want to, but it's realistic. When you start playing some of these shooters and you start to feel that each gun has a different force feedback based upon how the real gun works in the real world. It's amazing. And then you just start playing other games with it and you see how they use it. It's It changes the game. Now, my big complaint, and the reason it's not number one for me, is its ergonomics. For whatever reason, PlayStation decided to add some like angles to it. 
and not just like angles somewhere that aren't important, like angles where you grab it with your hands. So it does get a little uncomfortable for me if I spend a lot of time playing a game. Now, you know, to me that's spending like eight hours at a day playing and I realize most people won't do that, but these are my top five best controllers of all time, not yours. So to me, the DualSense controller is amazing. It is one of the biggest differences, for me at least, for new gen consoles. It's using that DualSense PS5 with all its new fancy features. I love it. Finally, number one. And this may not be that controversial, we'll see. But my number one pick for the best controller of all time is the Xbox 360 controller. Now, one argument I would make for the 360 controller is that it was kind of the pinnacle. I feel like a lot of the things that have come since the Xbox 360 controller are specialized for specific needs. Like for example, the back of the Series 2 Elite controller with the paddles, like just unneeded stuff. To me, the Xbox 360 controller was the perfect apex of functionality and practicality. The ergonomics are amazing. I could literally play games all day and my hand would never hurt with that thing. It had the right amount of buttons. It had the right amount of travel in the trigger. It had the offset analog sticks, which I'm a fan of. It was just the perfect controller in almost every way. Now, it is close for me between the Xbox 360 controller and the DualSense, but the ergonomics win the day and the offset sticks give the 360 controller a nod. I have spent more time with the 360 controller in my hands than any other controller I've ever played with in my life, and I never, ever had a single complaint with it. Even the battery packs, the rechargeable battery packs that you could buy for the 360 controllers, they'd last forever. They'd never die. I still have battery packs that I can recharge to this day for the Xbox 360 controller. It was just perfect. It was the next evolution of the Xbox controller S for the OG Xbox, but just vastly improved in pretty much every way. So again, I just feel like that era when I played games, probably more than I had ever played in my life, it may ever play them again. That controller was the perfect companion. It never let me down. It never broke. I think I have, I'm not exaggerating, like 10 or 11 Xbox 360 controllers because they would keep releasing new colors for big games that would come out and Microsoft would just keep sending them to me. And because they never break, I have my very first one that I got with my launch unit that eventually red ringed. And then I just kept getting more and more and the old ones would never break. And I just ended up with this gigantic collection of Xbox 360 controllers. So while I know it may be controversial to some of you guys, uh, my glory days in so many ways were with an Xbox 360 controller in my hand and it never let me down. So to me, the best console controller of all time, the Xbox 360. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to GMG. I'm Shane Satterfield. Follow me on Twitter at Dinfire and follow Sifted at Sifted Games. And while you're on the interwebs, head to patreon.com slash sifted and get this show in a podcast feed the way it's supposed to be listened to, people. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow, but until then, make sure you seize this day because there will never be another. Another.